clicking up quickly and we're launching our recording so that everyone's aware that they're being recorded. Um, for those of you who are here, thank you for being live uh, and with us today. And for those of you who are watching this later after the fact, we, uh, we hope you're enjoying today's presentation. Um, HGAR hosts these, uh, these fabulous webinars, both monthly live, um, as well as stores them on their, their website. So people can gain the knowledge and the perspectives and the insights uh, who couldn't quite make this live meeting. Um, so that's why we're recording it for that purpose. Um, okay, well, with that, we're two minutes into the top of the hour. Uh, I'm gonna launch us in and, and, and get started, even though we've got, I'm sure some more participants, the count is still rolling up quickly. Um, my name is Brian Tormey. I'm the president of TitleVest uh, and the New York State Manager for First American and very excited to launch into 2023 uh, with this fabulous crew of individuals. Um, uh, the, and I'm gonna turn over to Richard here in a second, but I wanna say a big thank you to Richard. This is, I think we are really counting up what's been you know, a full two years and change that we've been doing these. We're getting close to the three year mark since when we started these. Um, and it's just, it's been such a pleasure and a joy in my life. I was definitely saying thankful, that, you know, thanks and gratitude for it um, over the holidays and excited to be here in 2023, launching another great year of Be Your Best series webinars. Um, with that, Richard, I'm gonna turn it over to you uh, and then we'll go through and get started. Are you so I am unmuted. Thanks, Brian. And you know, I'm equally excited. This has been a great partnership that we've had with Title Best now going on our third year. And it's been one of the highlights. So we certainly have welcomed uh, the previous uh, participation and we still look forward to a great 2023. And I want to welcome everybody to yet another edition of Be Your Best, our webinar series to share best practices for getting real estate deals done in New York. I am Richard Haggerty, CEO of OneKey MLS, the comprehensive multiple listing service for the New York region. OneKey has more than 46,000 subscribers and serves the region from Montauk to Manhattan to Monticello. Uh, and I do have a new title this year. I took the helm of OneKey MLS at, as of January 1st, after an affiliation of almost four decades with the Hudson Gateway Association of Realtors. I'm very proud of all the accomplishments that we had at HJAR which represents more than 14,000 real estate professionals in Manhattan, the Bronx, Westchester, Putnam, Rockland, and Orange Counties. I'm also very pleased to note that Janet Courier is serving as the interim CEO of HJAR as an executive search to replace me is underway. One key in the Hudson Gateway Association of Realtors have been hosting the Be Your Best webinar series for three years now, starting our third year with industry leaders examining the key issues for the New York residential real estate market. Today, we're taking an in-depth look at the market. It's a new year in New York and our panel will share their, the stats, trends, and strategies to help you get deals done in 2023. Again, I'd like to thank Brian, president of TitleVest for partnering with us on this series and moderating our panel today. TitleVest is a leading New York City-based title insurance agency and a member of the First American Family. Title Vest offers a full range of services for real estate property purchase and refinance transactions. Title Vest has offices in Manhattan and Westchester and engages in transactions upstate, downstate, and nationwide. Title Vest has won the New York Law Journal's best title agency for the last 10 years. And that string continues, Brian. Congratulations. Now let's meet our panel. We're pleased to have with us Kevin Brown. Senior Global Real Estate Advisor at Sotheby's International Realty. Also joining us is Elizabeth Stribling Kivlin, or EA as she's known, Senior Managing Director of Compass. And we also have Sherry Toback, Senior Vice President of the Related Companies. <coughs> Sherry, EA, Kevin, thank you so much for being here. And back to you, Brian. Excellent. Well, you know, I really want to say a big thanks to you, Richard, as well as Jeff, Gary, Kathleen, and the, the whole HGAR team for helping make this happen. Um, and thank you to EA, Sherry, and Kevin for being here. Uh, a couple quick housekeeping items for our attendees today. Um, questions are extraordinarily welcome. We, we encourage you to submit questions. 
Uh, depending on what device you're engaging today, uh, you should be able to see to either down at the bottom or possibly if you touch the top of your screen, it'll sort of drop down a Q&A option amongst the sort of other options within things. It's two little chat bubbles on top of each other. Please submit your questions there. We'll be using the QA function and sort of looking for those questions. I'll be announcing and reading them out to the audience and our panelists here and, and answering them in that fashion. Um, otherwise, we have everyone muted just so that we're avoiding the background noise, especially with, you know, a few hundred participants, we want to make sure we don't accidentally have things going on that could be a distraction. Uh, but you're welcome to also use the chat function for additional commentary, or if one of the panelists is saying something that you've got a more of like less a question, more of a comment, or a yes, that's right, or that kind of thing, feel free to use the chat function to put it in. Everyone in attendance can, can see that chat function. Um, you know, Richard, before we jump into our action-packed agenda today, you've you've graced us with stats and metrics uh, at all of our meetings. I'm curious to, to know how do we round out 2022 from all the one key insights and data and perspective you have, how do we round out 2022? So not surprisingly, if you're looking just at the numbers and comparing 2022 to 2021, uh, the numbers would look grim, but you have to give it the context that uh, we're going to be sharing today. And while the numbers are about 30% down in every single county that we cover, and we cover more than a dozen counties in the uh, greater New York City area, we really have to focus on two things. We lost all seasonality to the market uh, during the 2020 and 2021 uh, years post pandemic, when we just had such a, a rush of activity. And we knew that wasn't sustainable. So I think that we definitely are seeing a return in the fourth quarter of 2022, where we, we're seeing a return of seasonality to the market. You know, I think also the buyers were taking a pause at the end of 2022. You know, interest rates were going up. We now are seeing uh, stability with interest rates and actually we're seeing interest rates come down. Uh, but I think everybody was taking a deep breath. But at the end of the day, if you compare 2022 to 2019, the first full year before the pandemic, 2022 still had stronger numbers, even in terms of closing out the year than 2019. So I think overall uh, it's, it's what we expected to see. At some point, we had to come off that steep uh, climb that we had at the uh, second part of 2020 and all of 2021, and even the first part of 2022. We just knew that that was not going to be sustainable. So now we're seeing a more normalcy and we're seeing, again, a, a return to seasonality. But I, I'm really excited to hear our expert panel talk about additional context in terms of these numbers, because I think they've got a lot to share. Yeah, yeah, context is key, right? Well, here, I'm gonna start with a question, you know, and, and go around the panel here and with the following question. What is everyone seeing in the market? Is there uncertainty or hesitancy to buy because of recent reports, current job market, interest rates, those kind of factors? Are people, to use Richard's phrase here for a second, taking a pause, but you sense that they're still planning to enter and transact as they would otherwise, but we saw more of a pause and a return to seasonality? Or are there other sort of deeper factors influencing the decision making and what you're seeing? Um, EA, I might start with you if you're game. Yeah, of course. I'm happy to. It's such a pleasure to be here. So thank you um, to H. Garrett and Richard and, of course, Brian. It's so wonderful. Uh, yeah, well, I think it's, a, com it's a, com a combination of a lot of things. I think, one, remember that 2021 is a year we'll probably never see again. I don't think I'll see it again in my lifetime. And, you know, COVID, hopefully we'll never see another pandemic. So I think that it's we, we live in this world of Instagram and TikTok, which my wife actually is listening today. I, I'll say I'm on it all the time. But we have this very short memory span. So we look at the world and like we're very getting so granular as opposed to looking, you know, in the grander perspective. So I think it's really important we take out 2021 and even through the end of 2020. Um, so I think that that's that's hard. And I think that there's very much this loving mentality. Suddenly everyone's buying. Everyone wants to buy. Let's, you, know, you don't have FOMO from it. Um, so I think that with interest rates going up, everyone was so concerned about that. Where is the world going? Where is all this stuff? And it's very easy just to look at the Instagram or the, the, the headline and not delve into actually the fact that, you know, prices have almost never been higher and rents are still very expensive. There's so much less inventory. Borders started opening earlier this year. Some borders are still a little bit tricky. So I think this is an instance where I always think to myself, I invest in homes. 
if no one else is buying, I want to get in there because there's opportunity. And I think New Yorkers and fifth generation are super, super smart. So the minute they start to see there could potentially be discounts, I think this is a temporary moment. And what, markets ebb and flow. That's what they're supposed to do. They're not always supposed to be rising. And I think us as advisors, we very much have to work in that capacity of saying, why is the person buying? Maybe there's an opportunity. I think 2022 wasn't the greatest year at the end for the fourth quarter. But if you look at the whole thing, it wasn't so bad. And I think activity is already picking up. Okay. Kevin, how about you? I'm going to turn to you, sir. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. And uh, what a great panel uh, that we have. The... Uh, I don't believe in seasonality. Uh, I've been uh, I've been doing this for 32 years. You know, when I was first in the business, that you know, like people would talk about seasonality. Uh, you know, I was convinced that you know, even then, 32 years ago, there wasn't seasons. It was that the brokers all left town and went to the Hamptons. Customers <laughs> were always here. Uh, you know, all we have now is not seasons. It's situations that are happening in the world. A smart broker is going to sit there and um, and read the tea leaves and are looking at all the different situations that are happening. Whether it's mortgage, uh, you know, the uh, rates that are going up. Whether what's happening in Wall Street, what's happening in the employment, uh, you know, industry. Uh, you know, I just uh, you know, heard somebody uh, give a talk. And an economist said, you know, their best advice to people is go where people are not buying. You know, like, uh, you know, and, and, you know, you sit there and going, you know, that is, you know, like what the smartest people are doing. Uh, smart people are, are buying. The, um, you know, you look at, you know, if you look at 2022, you can skew the numbers any way you want. Uh, the first half of the year was gangbusters. The second half of the year was lousy. You you mix the two, read those tea leaves, and you, you know, and you know, and you turn around and you sit there and going, uh, all real estate is local uh, in you know our little island of bliss that we call Manhattan. Uh, the east side is different than the west side. The west side is different than downtown. And then within each of those markets, for instance, uh, co-ops are different than condos. And within those markets, one bedrooms are different than two bedrooms and different than three bedrooms. So, you know, um, you know, when, you know, the entire world wants to um, have little one sentence answers to everything, but a smart broker is going to dig deeper um, and give, I think, intelligent responses um, you know, uh, to answers, you know, and, and uh, or to questions rather than give uh, flippant answers to saying, okay, the market's going up 4%. Well, what does that mean? Uh, you know, it's, it's incumbent upon us to um, uh, be a little bit more intelligent. Yeah. I think that there's a lot of wisdom in that, especially in a market like New York. There's so much nuance. You can't answer and speak to a market like New York in one bullet point. That's that's not a thing you can do successfully. And even though you know, like um, you know, customers might want that, you got to lead them um, and you know educate them. Uh, it's um, you know part of our responsibility. It's it's not supposed to be easy. Um, you know, if it was easy, then, you know, they'd be giving away real estate licenses to anybody and everybody. Oh, wait, they are. I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll I've, already this forgot, I've already forgotten your question, Bob. But, you know, like, uh, but so I don't believe in seasons. And, and um, but I do see that there is a change in the marketplace. Uh, the beauty of, you know, this panel, as well as what you all are doing is that you know like we all have boots on the ground so we can see things before it's reported in the new york times before you know other people uh see it so for instance all in new york city all you have to do is walk the streets in the last three weeks to start seeing that we're seeing uh asians uh specifically uh, from mainland china starting to uh walk the streets now uh we're starting to get calls 
uh, you know, and so we are starting to see the trickling of Asian buyers coming in. That's going to affect the entire marketplace. That's all it takes is uh, just those tiny little changes in the market. Yeah. Um, well, it looks like Sherry, uh, Sherry Toback from Related accidentally, I don't know what happened. She dropped out. Uh, my guess is she, oh, she's, probably, she's, she's probably coming, coming right another, back. Yeah, she's probably doing right, a sale. She'll be she's right, right back. She said, she sent an email, her computer switched off. She's working to get right back. So she okay, is on great. it. Great, no, thank you. No, she's uh, doing a sale. She's doing a sale. She's closing uh, a deal. That's what we gotta do. We gotta close the deal. <laughs> that's wonderful. Okay, well, well, no worries. We've got lots of great things. You know, the next thing I wanna to talk to, and, and, and Kevin, you actually spoke to this a second ago, is, you know, if the underpinnings of our economy are strong, broadly, you know, taking that for a minute, when compared with like other parts of the world, um, you know, do you think we're going to see uh, international buyers come back? And, you know, EA, I'm going to come back to you and let you answer this question as well. Kevin, you just touched on it. What are some of the thoughts on on the international market as we go into not just a U.S., you know, economic cycle, but like there are global, there are cycles happening in those other markets. What do we think is going to happen here in New York, one of the safe havens for in global investors? Do we think that's going to be a positive influence here in this next year? Well, yeah, and, and, and yes, and yes, and yes, uh, on all your questions. Uh, is that, you know, long question, short answer, yes. Uh, but, you know, like if you dig deeper again, you sit there and going uh, before uh, New York City, you know, like uh, was always looked at, and I apologize that I'm only talking about New York City. I can't talk about Westchester or all the other you know, communities, but New York City was considered to be a safety deposit box. You know, people would come and, um, you know, invest because every 10 years, you know, like you could double your money. Uh, it was, uh, you could do this with your eyes closed. Uh, now, and then COVID happened and all of a sudden we became, you know, like, um, you know, a safe haven uh, because we handled, um, you know, the COVID crises very well. And we also have more hospital beds than anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we just handled it very well. Mm -hmm. What I find fascinating is that now all of a sudden, my international buyers that are coming from, especially from Central America and South America are coming and it's the admixture of those two events. They're now coming from, you know, like, I, I probably in the last year sold six apartments to um, people from Mexico City. They're not buying um, to get out of Mexico City. They're keeping their places in Mexico City, but they're now buying instead of one and two bedroom apartments, they're buying three and four bedroom apartments mm -hmm. just in case the riots happen in Mexico City. Um, because you know, when all of a sudden the street vendors can't sell their, um, you know, tomatoes and apples and everything else, um, the poor are getting poor around the world and the rich are, you know, getting our stable, they're worried. And so where else are they going to go? They're not going to go to Oklahoma City or all the other uh, places. They're going to go to New York City. Uh, they feel safe here. Uh, they know that uh, the uh, health wise, so they're not as focused in on their safety deposit box issues. They, I'm not getting the question. Physical security as well. Yeah, I, I'm not getting questions about the rate of return that I was getting five years ago. They're hmm. sitting there going you know, like, oh, isn't this nice that I'm getting, you know, like, a, you know, if I rented it out, I get a 2.8% return or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. They're not that interested. Uh, and, and to your, uh, your question, you're not asking me about mortgage uh, rates or anything else. They're not that bothered whether it was a 3%, 6% uh, if they were getting a mortgage. It's that is not affecting uh, my buyers whatsoever uh, because they're focused on a bigger picture uh, mm -hmm. than uh, they were five years ago. It's, it's, it's a fascinating shift. 
So you're so and EA, you're next. I'm going to hand the same question over to you. And Sherry, welcome back. We'll come. Sorry, to you I apologize. My computer just Technology. decided it didn't want to do this anymore. No, so she, I had to Sherry, I told Sorry. everybody. You, I told everybody you were uh, doing another deal. Sorry, you're doing a deal for us. <laughs> Actually, that's yeah. what I was doing. I made up a computer story, but yeah, the exactly. deal is done. <laughs> I apologize. Exactly, to a Chinese family. <laughs> um, so Who just of, managed to get here. Kevin, exactly. um, you know, sort of saying, yes, I think foreign investors increasing flow here in the new year. EA, how about you? Yeah, well, I think so. I think that the U.S., you know, you, have, you always have to look at what the currency play is, right? I think there's some good mm -hmm. currency plays right now. And I think often you'll find when economies, even if our economy is going down, we tend to have more stability. So I think there's a safe haven if, I, if you know, money, again, as I said earlier, markets have been flow. But I think there's, you know, to go to Kevin's point, there's a security in one, you know, the currency, there's one in safety. And I think that also people see opportunity. So I think that plays into it. I think you'll also see it increase because the Canadian market's been shut down. The Canadian market's been shut down to foreign investment. There was a very, very large play coming in for, from Asia, especially into Western Canada in mm -hmm. BC and Vancouver. That is done. So I think that will only yep. put more um, onto our economy. And I think also, yeah. you know, Canadian... Just so, I mean, I think it's important to know that Canadians are the number one buyer of property in the U.S. I mean, they're mainly buying in Florida, Arizona, and California, but they are buying here. And I think that you know, they're very investment minded. I think that will help um, mm -hmm. with more of that uh, capital coming in here as their market tries to, you know, tries to find adjust. its own way to, mm -hmm. to adjust. So I think that that should be a big thing. And we also have a great education system. You know, additionally, I think that there were some monies going into California. Obviously, the weather there is just continually. I mean, anyone from California on this call, you know, my, my, my in-laws are out there. It's, it's horrible right now. So we're thinking about you and your families. But I think that with the fires and that this sort of New York metro area is becoming more and more um, it's becoming more and more of a draw because even on a larger scale, and at the end of the day, let's be frank, New York, I'm sorry, it's the greatest place in the world. It's the melting pot. Most people immigrate to this, to New York uh, when they come to the U.S. And there's still something. I mean, if you want, can get your tiny little square foot of it or a sherry at Hudson Yards, you get 2,000 of it, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, 5,000 a foot, whatever it is. But to have that little piece, I think it's a dream for a lot of people. And I think mm -hmm. that, that will only continue because New York has bounced back better than I believe any American city from COVID. I think it's better than it ever was. Yeah. Okay. So EA, another very strong endorsement of sort of like <laughs> outside foreign investors, in addition to domestic and, you know, other market movers here locally, strong influence there. Sherry, how about you? Um, okay. Why don't you repeat the question? Oh, yeah, sorry, because right. I'm listening so, to the answers. <laughs> yep. Yep. So the question was really like, what are you seeing, you know, as it relates to foreign investors and right. their perspective here about New York, as we look into the new year, like, do yeah. we think that that's going to be a, a, a growth area of our investor buyer side or, or yeah. not? Well, look, fingers crossed. I, I truly, <laughs> you know, as you and I have, and we all have discussed recently, I'm, I'm very, very bullish on the market for 2023. Um, I'm really excited about China opening up again because for the luxury buyer, I, I always found that the Chinese buyers were very savvy, very smart, followed market trends, um, were not afraid of jumping in in new situations, i.e. Hudson Yards. Um, so we're very, very excited about that. I, I met a couple yesterday who is buying an apartment here from Australia, um, which was interesting because I think that's a whole new avenue that I haven't seen before. Um, we're seeing um, some Europeans. We're certainly seeing some Brits here. Um, so I, I, I'm pretty excited about things opening up. And I kind of agree very strongly with EA that um, New York is the melting pot. New York is not, as I said last time, Akron, Ohio. It is New York. Um, everyone wants to be here. Everyone wants a piece of the action. And whether it's Hudson Yards, which, yeah, is for a small group of people because the price point is high. Um, it is now a very, very recognized neighborhood and people are excited to be here. Um, it's more of a destination than it ever was. And so for, for Hudson Yards, I'm, I'm really excited about the international buyer because I find, you know, no matter where you are in the world now, um, six years later, 
everyone knows who Hudson Yards is, what, what Hudson Yards is. And, and up until even two or three years ago, we would have to explain the concept to everybody. Yeah. Now, no matter where you come from, no matter where I, I travel, I mention Hudson Yards and people are aware of it um, as something really exciting and new and innovative and all encompassing um, mm -hmm. in New York. I see um, taxi ads now where they're not necessarily um, brokers who are touting Hudson Yards, but they are saying, um, you know, we have a view of Hudson Yards. We're right near Hudson Yards. So I do think mm -hmm. that um, these foreign investors are going to be coming back. I do think that, you know, as I mentioned to you, all of you earlier, we had a very, very robust end of 2022. Um, mm -hmm. which I know is kind of contradictory to the rest of the market. A lot of it was foreign investors. Um, a lot of it was New Yorkers, for sure. Um, we're seeing way more New Yorkers than we ever have because New Yorkers are now really excited and comfortable with Hudson Yards, with Lantern House, with the Cortland, with our mm -hmm. conversions. Um, the entire related portfolio seems to be really picking up a lot of speed lately. But I'm really excited about foreign investors coming in for 2023. I think we're yeah, but, in, but, in, in for a very but, good year. Like, like, um, I have to like uh, do a plug for you uh, personally, uh, as well as for Related. You know, it, uh, that's what maybe makes New York City uh, so unique. Developers led the way and have been the stability uh, for New York City real estate uh, because they have in some ways uh, set the price uh, they've been flexible on uh, reading the tea leaves um, in their pricing uh, far more than uh, the resale market. No question. You know, owners, no question. You, know, you know, hold on to their pricing. Uh, the developers, um, you know, have uh, been in the forefront, you know, related, you know, Gary Barnett, you know, like all these, you know, like developers, you know, like uh, have been forward thinking and and that but and then the sales uh, team have just been phenomenal. I mean, are the quality of sales team uh, are such um, a high level right. that you know, like compared to anywhere else, I have, I you know, Miami. You go anywhere else in the country, you know, you all just have done a great job. And Thank so you. you know, like um, I, my hats off off to you. I appreciate that. You know, I think I think a lot of it comes from the passion that um that is all part of this i've been working for hudson yards now i've been involved with i've been with related for more years than i even like to admit i've been here for 17 years already so i have watched the evolution of hudson yards from the very very beginning i was involved in floor plans and pricing and buildings and architecture and makes, um, it, all it the makes development that came with it and i think that the team here is is not just my sales team, but the team in general um, has been phenomenal and innovative and brilliant. And I cannot imagine anyone without, you know, tooting our horn or Steve Ross's horn, who was the the, the genius That's behind it. Hudson Yards. I cannot imagine anyone else bringing this to fruition the way that we have brought it over the past um you know, around years. 10 years since we yeah. first got involved since, you know, since my paycheck was coming from Hudson Yards, it's been quite a while. So yeah. um, it, it, it's been very, very exciting. And I do, I appreciate the, the kudos because I believe this is not, it's not like selling a building. You're not selling a building. You really are. And not to like, sound cliche, you no. are selling a lifestyle. You're selling yep. so much yeah. more than come look at my building and look at our gym and look at our pool. There is so much more to the story. And people who are living here and who are buying here love it. Everybody loves living at Hudson Yards. And in fact, as you're saying, it's not just um, our building, it's our other buildings, it's Gary's buildings, it's all of the big developers who have had this innovative thought to kind of set the tone for the market, set the tone for commissions, set the tone for pricing, set the tone for pretty much uh, everything, New York, you know. New York City, Brian. Yeah. It's all about the city. Well, so I want to go to something. We In our prep chat, we were talking about things, and I think, you know, if people look back, 
at that really big pause that happened in March of 2020, right? We have a pandemic, everyone's head is spinning, trying to figure out what's happening. The US epicenter located here in the New York area and, and everything. If you paid attention to that pause, everyone was running away from New York City for, for a hot minute there, right? And if you paid attention to that pause, you could have possibly done very well. And I, EI, you had some interesting comments around the road not taken. And I wanna explore here as we're in a year where we're sort of, we've got the, 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 the larger real estate market has headwinds that we have had some tailwinds the past few years. Now I've got some headwinds. Yay, I want you to sort of share some of those thoughts you had and Kevin and Sherry, you had some great examples as well that I think may help be good anecdotes or stories, but, but real world ones for our audience today to be thinking about as we're in this market where yes, interest rates are much higher than they've been for the near term past. Prices are, as we were saying earlier, at some of their highest points they've been. Um, let's talk about some of the roads not taken of yesteryear that may help remind us why transact why transacting in New York, which is, I have to say, the best city in, in the world, <laughs> um, why transacting in New York now does possibly make good sense. So EA, I'm going to turn to you first. Right. So I, I, I keep talking about media. So I'm going to go back to media. So I, to the detriment of my poor family, watch a lot of real estate television. I watch, you know, I love like house hunters and, and you know, wouldn't it be great if every time you took a person out, they looked at three properties and bought one. I mean, we know it isn't real, but, you know, <laughs> I do watch a lot of it, but there are all these house flipping shows and, you know, there's all this going on. So you have to have these perfect houses. So we sort of are started, I think everyone has this like myopic view of you buy a place, you live in it for a few years and then you sell it for a big profit. So we, we're thinking in such a small way. I think back to the time there used to, there was a penthouse at Gilsey House, which is in Nomad. Mm -hmm. And I almost bought it and I just couldn't fathom. It was asking, I don't know, it was well under a million dollars. And I thought, God, there's just no way anyone's going to want to live on 29th and Broadway. Like this was years right. ago, but I like it. I actually, it's funny, I almost bought a, right. I almost, oh, yeah, I almost bought a loft um, near Hudson Yards at the same time. But he was so big. I mean, I could have like ridden my bike around it. But I thought, Ugh, you know, interest rates are seven and a half percent. Where is it going to go? Now I look back on my life. I would have had, I would have made money on it, but there's a possibility I wouldn't have. We're so obsessed with the interest rates, but I most likely would because I would have lived there. Most people live in a house for a long time. And then we forget, wait a second, there's an emotional value to this. If you're buying a home to live in, what is that worth? Is it? Are you going to really get rid of all of those family memories over maybe $6,000 that you could have depreciated over years. And as an investor, there are actually reasons the higher interest rates can work for you. When it goes to sell, you're doing 1031s. I think it's looking at the bigger picture. You have to look at it. And who, when, when it, there were years at that cocktail party, and when someone says to you, you know, I really overpaid for something. And that was really great. And I'm selling it the next day. That's not the story you remember. You remember the story. I think of my mom. My mom bought a building in Chelsea in the early in the in the late 80s and everyone thought she was the craziest person ever for doing it. interest rates were higher what turned up it went up a little bit in value but she knew it was the right thing to do and it was the right thing financially but also emotionally and I think we have to consider that too we're always going to have a lot of stories you're not going to be able to afford everything but if it's going to come down to an extra six thousand dollars over your lifetime is that worth the happiness? And remember, sometimes if you actually look at it, like the actual cost of like the longer move will cost more than the, you know, what it would have, what the actual like monthly nut was. So I just think, you know, 20 years is a long time and prices haven't gone down in 20 years. That's for sure. Yeah, agreed. Um, you know, Kevin, I might turn to you. You had a, you had a one that I wish I could have had. Uh, why don't, why don't you share one of your anecdotes? Well, <laughs> I'm not sure which one I had to know. You may know. It was after Dakota. Uh, uh, it was Dakota. Well, and you know, uh, well, no, actually, you know, I, you know, I, another thought came to uh, mind is mm -hmm. that, you know, I mean, it's, it's wonderful, like, uh, now that I'm uh, the ripe old age of 70, uh, that, you know, like, uh, I, I can be a little bit flippant with uh, customers and clients. Uh, so whenever anybody says to me about, you know, the value of a property, I'm taking them out, I immediately turn to them and I say, oh, I didn't realize that you're a flipper. And they go, I'm not flipping the property. And I say, then why are we having this discussion? I don't know what's happening in seven years. <laughs> Do you love the property? 
<laughs> right. it's, it's, you just look at the historic numbers, uh, kind of like what EA is saying. You're like saying, you know, like, do you love the property? Right. You know, that's, you know, you're buying a home. Uh, that's the, you know, you know, issue. You know, uh, you know, you can't fix the, uh, if it's next to a fire um, house, uh, you know, like look at the things you can't fix. Uh, but, you know, like if you love the property, uh, don't worry about it. You know, like, cause uh, it's like, uh, you know, buying you know, in the stock market. Uh, but if you ask somebody, you know, like uh, just that question, you know, I'm saying this to our audience, you know, ask the, you know, your buyer saying, are you flipping the property? And once you uh, get them to zero in on that, they're saying no. Then saying now you've refocused them on what's yeah, important on the emotion, you know, and and you know, and you know, regarding you know the Dakota or you know, like I can think of a, a thousand other examples, but the Dakotas that you know you could have bought you know the Dakota you know for again fifty thousand dollars for a very large apartment because nobody in uh, the nineteen seventies nineteen eighties. Uh, was buying there because the maintenance was so high. Uh, but I remember, you know, like, um, you know, I, I love, you know, like telling um, bad stories about myself. <laughs> I remember when 15 Central Park West um, went up and they were $3,000 a square foot. I just said, nobody in their right mind. They're like, I, nobody, like $3,000 a square foot? Jeez, you're like, I, you're never going to get your money out. Right. Well, you know, wrong, uh, you know, and so, you know, you know, again, everybody's crystal ball can be uh, cloudy, but, you know, the, you know, the point is that you're buying a, uh, at the end of the day, you know, like a home uh, for the most part. Yeah. And Sherry, how about you? Okay, so first of all, I want to pick up on a point that EA said, because I say this to my buyers all the time and to the brokers with whom I work. Buying real estate is not always a financial decision. It is often a, an emotional decision. So when you walk into a home and it feels right, emotionally, you want that home, regardless, as EA is saying, if the price is a little bit higher, if maybe you'll lose a little the first year, you'll gain a little. But, you know, as we've discussed in the past, the market is cyclical and things do go up in value. So for missed opportunities, I've had a few pretty bad missed opportunities myself. And for all of our knowledge, for all of our background, for all of our experience, we still, you know, um, 15th Central Park West opened pretty high and that sounded unreasonable. I remember when the Caledonia opened, which was a related <laughs> building, the first condominium in West Chelsea, the neighborhood didn't really exist yet. Yet. And I went to look at an apartment and my husband and I debated and we walked around the neighborhood and I said, who's going to buy here? The projects are here and, and, and people have tripled and quadrupled their, their, their value now. So that building, um, there have been so many missed opportunities. So I think that the bottom line is when you see an apartment that feels right and looks right and was is within your price point maybe you have to stretch a little further to get there, but I would always do the stretch if it feels good. Yeah. Okay, great. I'm going to turn to, you know, I'm going to jump a little bit forward to one of the questions that we talked about uh, being mindful of time. And we've got so much great content to get to, you know, we've got a market that for a while was very much a seller's market. And, and, and there was different subcategories within that. And now here we are in 2023. And the question I sort of want to ask to you three is, what are your thoughts on, you know, the sort of nature of the seller's market versus buyer's market? And are we seeing sellers sort of, you know, make concessions? Like, how, what are you seeing in the market in terms of pricing, concessions, closing cost coverage, some of those patterns you're seeing that can help inform uh, you know, our audience here, because they don't necessarily know, you know, we need to sort of get that from this kind of context. We don't know it until those transactions are fully booked and closed and recorded and all that kind of stuff. So give some insights. What are you seeing here as we're launching into the new year? Um, Sherry, I'm actually going to start with you. Um, right. We're going to sort of go back around the, the horn the other way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. And, and Sherry, tell the truth. <laughs> I'm going to be very honest with you. So, okay. because again, I think this sets trends. So yeah. I, as I have said in real estate in all the years, many, many years that I've been in real estate as well, 
everything sells if the price is right. It won't mm -hmm. sell if the price is wrong. So we have on many occasions at Related sat down with our executives and explained these prices are just a little too high. And if we're not getting offers, even if people like what they see and we're not getting offers, we need to re-examine the pricing. So we have definitely done price reductions at Hudson Yards and it has proven to be very, very helpful. But what's important is leaving room because every single buyer wants to negotiate. And I don't care if you're at 2,000 a foot or 4,000 a foot or even 1,000 a foot, everybody wants to feel like they're getting a bargain, that they're getting a deal, that we're giving them the best deal. So we always leave a certain amount of room to allow for concessions. Now, whether that's paying for their transfer tax or um, giving them six months common charge or, or whatever or we can do to make the deal more appealing for that particular buyer, mm -hmm. um, we will do. And so I, I think that is why we were, you know, as I explained to all of you guys recently, I think that's why we managed to be so successful last year, especially toward the second half of the year, because we did re-examine prices and we did re-examine with the banks, where can we actually go? Where, where mm -hmm. can we go where the banks will still be happy and and the the you know the developers will still be happy and we came to a medium we came to a bottom line where i know i can sell it to you for this and i'm going to stick in a little bit of an extra gift here and there to make it a little more palatable and um I think that's the most important thing. And at Hudson Yards also, we help with financing. And that's not to say that we will finance, but with throughout the related portfolio, we do have um, a finance division who will sit with you and say, you know, our director of, of financing, who will sit with you and say, look, this is what you want to buy. This is how much money you have. This is what your background is. Let me suggest that you go here because we can get you a rate of this at this bank. And that does help a great deal um, to be able to literally hold a buyer's hand throughout the process. Um, and which is one of the great things I think about related where we build the buildings, we sell the buildings and we hold your hand through the closing and even after um, and Brian, I think a lot of hand holding. And Brian, yeah. I, I just want to point out, you know, like if you listen uh, and your audience uh, listens to Sherry very carefully, listen to um, what she's saying is that uh, and what's the big difference from 20 years ago, Sherry is facilitating a transaction. She is not trying to win. Um, 20, 30 years ago, brokers all that, I don't know about Westchester and uh, the rest of the country, if you know, like brokers like compete with each other. Mm -hmm. Sherry is uh, such a great broker because what she's doing is facilitating a transaction. But That's I still want to win. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, but uh, yeah, you know who. But it, uh, I, uh, I agree. I, I understand. But there's a, there's a like, learning to win in the long run, sometimes meaning means like, you know, having a moderate win. Right. No, but but you moment. facilitate a transaction. You know, when you're dealing with another pro uh, on the other uh, side, you both uh, say to each other, saying, "How can I make this happen?" And yeah. that is key. right. What and will it take what, to make this deal happen for you? Yeah, that's yeah. what's wonderful in New York City. That's what I think that we do. The like the better bro brokers, we all say to each other, "Okay, where where can we make this happen?" Right. Right. EA, I want to turn to you next. You know, you, you know, had a, a great branded company that you've been with for many years, now part of the Compass Enterprise, lots of data, like lots of perspective across the whole thing. What are, what are you seeing? What is the team there seeing in terms of these patterns and, and getting deals done? Well, I think it, first off, it all starts with this. I hate more than anything when I see a headline come through and it says, Townhouse sold for 40% off the 40% uh, discount. Well, it didn't actually. It sold 40% off of an inflated asset Bad price. price. <laughs> right. It did not sell for a discount. It sold for what it was worth. And I think that's very important. Markets bear what markets bear. What was the selling price? It's the value. Now, mm -hmm. there are times the value can go up or down. Yes, I completely agree with Sherry. I mean, I think that everybody right now wants a discount. And a lot of people think they can come in and say, oh, it's asking. You know, I, I want to move to Dobbs Ferry. I'm going to make, make, make these numbers are wrong. I want to move to Dobbs Ferry. House is $800,000. Nobody's moving. Here, take four hundred. dollars That's not going to work, right? It just, it's not going to work, but they want to do that. I do think there has to be some room. I mean, on a national level, you know, there's also, I, I think you're seeing, you know, when it comes to new development on a national level, um, you know, single family home builders have seen prices rise um, 
the cost of building a single family house has gone up like there's an extra $30,000 per year. There's very little margin for them. So they're not reducing prices, right? But they're going to offer concessions. I think there's things to be done. That being said, if you price something well, it will sell very quickly. I think it's going to sell. But if you, I think if you're over 10% of where the actual market value is, I think it's going to be very hard to sell. So yeah. this is a very good time for agents on this call. You know, you want to be the first love, the second spouse, the third agent. I mean, it's a colloquial thing to say. But your time's very valuable. So do you want to take something that's overpriced and someone believes that it's COVID timing? I think you're worth a lot an hour and don't forget that. And I think that that's really important. You don't want to work with people who realistically want to sell. Yeah, I think that's some great wisdom. Kevin, turning to you. What's the question? <laughs> <laughs> what are you seeing in trends and patterns as it relates to sellers and sort of like, are they, are they, have they moved into sort of recognizing it's a little bit closer to a buyer's market and making some of those? Uh, no, I, I think sellers are more realistic than brokers. I mean, we call everybody brokers. Uh, I think uh, that's an interesting you know, perspective. Yeah, you know that you know uh, you know typically I give a range uh, to sellers, and sellers um, you know are um, uh, they drank the Kool Aid far more than the okay. uh, brokers will like go out there um and you know overprice things mm -hmm. uh you know the you know when i'm taking um buyers buyers out for instance i always tell them saying um there are no bargains in new york city you know my job is to find good value now yeah. that you know like um and what you know like to ea's point uh, which is a very valuable point is saying that no it's just you know yes you read about the aspirationally priced uh sales but those are aspirationally priced sales. You know, things uh, that are, are, you know, like the great, great majority of sales are, are uh, selling four to 6% off the last asking price. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the way, you know, what, what uh, we price things. I mean, you go into a building, you know, I don't know how people in, you know, like Westchester and all the rest of the country price things. Um, you, know, I, you know, God bless them uh, because every house is different. You know, every yard is different. I go into a building and, you know, like, and, and I walk in and the little old lady says, my apartment is different than, and I'm thinking to myself, there's 60 apartments identical right above and 60 below, but your white walls are, are special. You know? They're eggshells, Kevin, they're eggshell. I know, they're eggshell. So you're like, I mean, to price something in New York City is, is, is kind of, you know, like, you know, like pretty easy. Uh, you know, and, Although I say there's like there's all these other aspects of new york that are different than those other markets you know the locate the building the location transportation the directionality of your windows all those things you know but, but, but yeah kind of of, of course you know like within but you know like but don't it, undersell yourself it's it's harder I, than it it's looks. a very tight it's a very tight you know like um you know appraising or valuation uh process and so so that's the reason why you know like um you know when we go in um a straightforward you know agent uh it's a very you know, like a uh, narrow evaluation process and so i think that uh, sellers are far, far more realistic than um, agents are. Um, you know, not that you've asked this question. You know, uh, you know, my crystal ball is I think we're going to actually the next two quarters um, <clears throat> we're going to be adjusting. We're going to have a great, you know, like uh, uh, 2023 is going to be uh, uh, overall a very nice year. Not a great year, nice year. Uh, we're going to be going up, up, up. 2024 hold on you know like uh because that's going to be an election year a national uh, election year and uh, great distractions um um again because um uh, that's every national election in new york city um boy do people get distracted uh and that just throws off our market every four years and so and enjoy uh, to all the brokers out there in New York City. Enjoy, enjoy, 2023. enjoy 2023. Uh, plan your vacations for 2024. Okay. Well, you've Can you I ask a quick follow-up question? Yeah. And I, I think this kind of echoes a, a question that's in the Q&A. Are there any neighborhoods in Manhattan or the other boroughs that you're especially bullish on in terms of great value, in terms of hidden gems? 
for 2023? Elizabeth, I, I think you have I, one. I yeah, love I, Queens. I love Queens. I think Ridgewood's amazing. I think Jackson Heights is amazing. I think we talk, it, P.S. Like lived in Dumbo. My family lives in Brooklyn Heights. Like I love Brooklyn and I love Manhattan. I grew up on the Upper East Side. But Queens is such an overlooked borough to me. It's, if you work, I mean, it, you know, I've been back in the office five days a week for two years. Queens is closer to Manhattan. I think there's some really great housing stock there. I think, you know, prices have gone up there. I love Ridgewood. I love Mathbeth. I love Astoria. I think there's this great adage, and it doesn't matter if you're in Westchester or Connecticut, you always say to someone, hey, you know what? Humor me and look at one apartment. But I think that those are some really great ones. I also think that Riverdale, I think Riverdale is a really amazing community. It's a real bridge between uh, the city and also um, going a little bit further up. And I think also, I, Fidei, I think there's some room in Fidei. And EA, don't you find that uh, that Queens um, has like neighborhoods still? Yes, it's really you well. Know, it's like yeah, like the yeah. New York of my childhood, and there's amazing yeah. food. I mean, my, yeah. food. who didn't? Everyone, like, my mother-in-law came in through Queens, and if you, so many people's story, and I think it's always a great story. How did you end up in New York or America? Mm -hmm. I came to Queens, and Queens is a launching pad for so many incredible people, yeah. ideas, cultures, and we don't give it enough credit. We just and don't. And we have, because we, we've lost so many of our neighborhoods in, in yeah. New York, um, you know, like there's, we don't have neighborhoods in the same way. I mean, it, Manhattan's always reinventing itself. Yeah. Uh, I mean, right now, the Upper East Side, um, you know, like if you want to talk about, you know, like a dead zone, and that's where the values are, is the Upper East Side. No question about it. No yeah. question. The Upper East Side has the best value in New York City right now. And yeah. I, I, I spent a lot of time looking recently for an apartment for myself. And I, I know a good broker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I know a good broker. I, 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 you know, I know a couple myself, but yeah. <laughs> I'll keep you in mind, Kev, next time around. <laughs> but I spent a lot of time looking and I had specific needs, spe specific wants. I was moving from the Upper West Side where I had a big giant apartment um, mm. and I was over it. And, and then I found my best value and, and I, I went kicking and screaming because I'm a New Yorker and I have lived on the east side, I've lived on the west side, I've lived downtown and I've lived in Brooklyn. So I, I've been around, but I found the best value was the Upper East Side. I can get more bank for my buck. I can get into a much nicer building in a much nicer neighborhood with a much nicer view than I could anywhere in New York City. And I was very open to other neighborhoods. So I, I definitely think things have turned around. When I was growing up in the city, the East Side was really yeah. expensive you know no, nobody could afford to live there and suddenly now it is the place to get the best value and i think the east side will start to come back oh i mean the fact that you can uh, buy a condominium um uh, for you know like um a thousand twelve hundred dollars a square foot you right. know like a b plus um on the you know upper east side mm -hmm. yeah amazing amazing okay great question richard um uh, the the thing that we're you know nearly at time we've got a couple minutes left so I'm going to turn to that crystal ball question Kevin you you answered it already you jumped into I hadn't asked the question yet but you've answered it uh, EA and Sherry I want to turn to you um, and ask the question of you know what do you see in the new year what are the trends and patterns and and when and and in the new year and as Kevin said and thereafter. You know, what are you sort of seeing as far as you can see into your crystal bar ball? Um, what what would you say? Bar? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm doing a dry January. If you can't tell, I'm like there's that, that Freudian slip just happened. I'm, I'm ready for a bar. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, but no, uh, what can what can you see what in your crystal ball as you look forward? Yeah, I'll go to you first. Well, I wish I was at the crystal bar right now, but um, <laughs> it's, a, it's 12.55. We're going to have to admit. Uh, I know. I, I'm, yeah, I'm also dry January or sort of more dry in life. But um, I think that I think it's going to be a little bit slow at the beginning of the year. And I think that I, I don't just mean, I, you know, I often say, like, don't look nationally, like really look locally. But I actually think in this capacity, I think that there's a little bit of headwinds we have to get through. And I think that, you know, people understanding interest rates, where they're going. Um, I think the, but I think that very quickly people start picking up on, ooh, that's opportunity. Ooh, that's opportunity. Oh, I see that. Like I'm starting to see a lot of price drops come through and my investor hat is like totally on again, where it hasn't been for two years. 
So I think you're going to see more people like me who are like, oh, yes. And also, again, people, you know, a lot of people still have to move in, in life. And I think that with uh, the current economy, you're going to see people moving. I think that we're going to go back to what we have not seen, I think, in like 10 or 15 years. I think by the middle of the year, we're going to see what I love more than anything, a normal market. And I hate the word normal. But okay. I think that would be great. Okay. So sort of like a uh, a market where we've got sort of meeting that that dial is, you know, just at the seller buyer side. We're just sort of hanging out in the middle. Transactions are flowing. People are doing things. It's not we're not pulling our hair out, but we're not starving either. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's EA's perspective. Sherry, how about you? I mean, my my opinion is this, and I, I this is how I feel. I think interest rates are high. Prices mm -hmm. are are lower than they had been in the year or two prior, I think that's going to catch up to it, 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 They're going to catch up to each other. Eventually, interest rates will go back down. This, we're going to catch up with inflation. Interest rates will go down so that if you're able to buy something now at good value that you know is kind of underpriced, but it's going to go up in value, I think it's there's going to be a good switch where prices will go up interest rates will go down and people will be really, really happy with the investments that they made. So I'm, I'm looking to 2023 as a very, very important year for all of us. Okay. So some, generally speaking, some pretty bullish responses on 23. A little bit of Kevin, I think you're right. We've got sort of, you know, politics and other macro factors at play in 24. So let's, let's go build and enjoy in 23. With that, Kevin, any any other thing you would add in to the crystal ball perspective? Uh, you know, yeah, 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 and I want to be positive. You know, like uh, you can be, be honest. But, Better well, to be honest. You know, I'm always honest, but that you know, it's you know, like you know, also you know, like um, we are all sensitive about you know the stock market, but I'm also sensitive to you know, like the local market with the um, the. Uh, little like um, boys and girls on Wall Street and their bonuses uh, for uh, 2022, uh, because with such, uh, uh, what is it, 70, 75% of our market are co-ops, uh, those are the folks that are buying the co-ops, uh, uh, the people who get their bonuses. Well, you know, that I keep an eye on uh, also saying that they're not going to have the, you know, like all the- The same uh, liquidity. Like, you know, the, yeah, they're not going to ha have the same bonuses that, you know, uh, in 2023 20, uh, that they had in 2022. So, you know, like, I'm watching, you know, like that also. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, like, um, you know, like uh, the health of the entire economy is, is so great because people like um, their, you know, equity in their homes have gone up. Um uh, you know, also, you know, like, um, you know, kudos to uh, Leonard Steinberg that, you know, like uh, does his constantly is looking at the bigger picture and, you know, and, and you know, he writes about the, um, you know, older folks who are all like retiring and giving their money to their kids uh, and saying the great wealth that's going to be uh, being transferred uh, to the kids. Uh, to, you know, EA, I hope you're, you're going to get a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> you know, and so, you know, it's, uh, it's just, it, we're going to be in a, in a very, very strong position in the United States overall. And New York City, obviously, is New York City. And so we're going to be the beneficiary of it. Uh, you know, you know, but, you know, the strength of New York City is also its weakness. The strength of New York City is our stability. That also yeah. makes this boring. <laughs> but at least, at least the dining scene and the theater scene and all those other things are so fun. The social so scene. robust and and, so robust. And, and 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 we and we have Brian. <laughs> we do well, have Brian. I, I, we have. If Brian, I can do anything uh, to help create a good market here in, in New York City. I'd love to. Um, we're we're at time. I'm ready to wrap. Richard, I saw you come off mute. Was there anything else you wanted to add in as we concluded? No, nope, I just, nope. I can't thank the panel enough. Sherry, Kevin, EA, tremendous job. And Kevin, you're never boring. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all so much. Thank you everyone for being here. I hope everyone had a great time. Thank you. Sure did. Happy to you to all. Thank you all. Thanks, Bye everyone. everyone.